I'm Charlie Brooker and you're watching Screen Wipe, a programme all about television. Transform your lips with Nara Shine. Is that Pete Burns? It's unique, the new heart-shaped wand. Is that a cat's penis? Moisturising gloss. It's cat's penis, cat's penis, sweet. cat's penis, cat's penis, cat's penis. Jesus Christ! I'm watching a high-definition TV, and let me tell you, the visuals are so sharp you could cut your eyes on them. This documentary looks amazing! For all the hype about HD, you won't really notice the difference unless you buy a gargantuan screen. And for the first year or so, it's going to be little more than a tech demo, really. Lots of programs turning their sharpness knob up to 11 to impress early adopters. Of course, high def is merely the latest in a string of evolutional leaps that have transformed the way we sit slumped in front of a box wishing we were dead. It all began back in 1936 with the invention of television broadcasting itself. Early broadcasts, seen here reconstructed in colour in 1976, just to confuse you, largely consisted of exquisitely posh presenters and manky bits of music. Lore. 1964 and BBC Two, or as the French call it, Bebez et Deux, bursts on air three years later introducing colour used to great effect in this early dramatisation of the Quality Street tin. 1967 also sees the first international satellite transmission, a six-hour special famous for this uplifting performance from the Beatles. A message the world stubbornly failed to heed. Nevertheless, the great leaps forward keep greatly leaping forward. Scrub forward to the 70s and bingo! Magic writing on the box seen here in the 80s to confuse you again. <laughs> it's not all luck today, is it? Come on! There it is. Right. As we move towards the present day, we get landmark diarrhoea. 1989, satellite TV arrives. 1992, NICAM stereo. 1999, digital broadcasting and widescreen. 2006 HD, and here we are, here. Thing is, HD is just a mere plip, technologically speaking. Computer monitors have been HD for years, TV's just catching up. The real changes are yet to come. Take scheduling, for instance. At the moment, it's a game of poker for TV networks where each channel attempts to win by playing their best hand. The man from the BBC thinks he's sitting pretty with EastEnders, but ITV's got a trump card there, a five-hour Emmerdale special. But modern hard disc recorders, which let you store up shows and watch them at your leisure, make a mockery of the whole notion of a schedule in the first place. People in telly sometimes bemoan this and say, oh no, it's the end of the collective viewing experience and people talking about things they've seen the next day, but that's bunkum. There's more water cooler talk than ever, it's just that it's on the internet. Actually, why am I telling you this? It's not like you don't already know. There's a good chance you downloaded this show off an unofficial torrent site and you're watching it on a laptop right now. Ooh, hark and pixel boy, yeah? Ooh. Or maybe you're on holiday watching it on a beach courtesy of one of those fancy remote viewing TV web streaming gizmos. Or maybe you're our lawyer vetting one of the rough cuts we make available online. The whole world's gone pixel bloody mad. Speaking of pixels, what about video games? Ooh, <laughs> In the space of 34 years, they've gone from simple representations of ping pong to fancy representations of ping pong, which you can play against network players all over the world. Why watch sport on TV when you can take part yourself? At the moment, TV, the internet and video games are three distinct entities, but the lines are blurring and soon they'll all be the same tossing thing. Yes, in a decade's time, TV as we know it will be unrecognisable. It will be a two-way device bristling with on-demand entertainment, social interaction and global virtual sports in which anyone can participate. Oh, and obviously it'll have a hatch on the side that dispenses pine nuts. People think television's a glamorous industry to work in, but is it really? Is it really? Is it really? Really, is it? Is it really? When I was a runner, I got called into my exec's office. He asked me to come to his desk, turn around and face the window, which I did so for half an hour. As I was leaving, I realised the fucker had used me as a sunblock to block out the sun from hitting his computer screen. I mean, what a prick. Emmerdale is fast overtaking EastEnders to become Britain's second favourite soap. Although, weirdly, I've never met anyone who actually claims to watch it. 
which is probably why it feels neglected and like any neglected child occasionally throws a tantrum to draw attention to itself. Arr, my arms! This be the worst accident I ever did see. Yes, there's so much death in the Dales, it's actually more of an uh, apocalyptic horror serial than a soap. And when Emmerdale residents aren't going, Ah, I'm on fire! They're keeling over for no apparent reason. <sighs> Mom! Mom! Before straining themselves to death on the toilet. <sighs> what's, what's the matter with you? Did it last <sighs> yeah, I'd give it ten minutes if I were you. In fact, there's so much fatality and strife going on in Emmerdale, they've recently taken to sticking flowers round the lens in a desperate bid to lighten things up. Sometimes it's almost as cheerful as an EastEnders Christmas special. <laughs> I said almost. Ask me, ask me if I'd like a favourite song played. Yeah. to the morbid atmosphere is the fact that half the cast consists of faces from TV's yesteryear. There's Elizabeth Estenson from the Liver Birds and Tea Bag, seen here quarrelling rather pointlessly with Emily Simons from Home and Away. There's also slick 70s heartthrob Patrick Mower. Veteran actor Freddie Jones pops up too, playing a ghost who lurks in the background to comment on the vicar's life. Can't you see you're upsetting her? You know why I couldn't tell you. Oh, and Nick Berry, who's let himself go a bit. Still, it's not all death, death, death. There's also love, which is expressed with a rare and beautiful lightness of touch. You know, the uh, idea actually excites me. Me too. You and me doing it in Matthew's bed. And, of course, there's love's hangover, pregnancy. We have someone you can see for counselling if this news comes as a bit of a shock. You're pregnant. I'm happy to tell you, Mrs Hope, that you're pregnant. In fact, you're pregnant is Emmerdale's second most commonly used phrase, shortly after, I'm afraid the house blew up and your daughter was killed. Still, despite all the sex and carnage, Emmerdale hasn't completely lost sight of its rustic roots. You still get the occasional squint at a pig or a goose. And this man's just had a conversation with a cow. A uh, cow's just told me about Kane and your friend. Anyway, I think I can just about see why Emmerdale's becoming so popular. It's simultaneously more glamorous and more grimy than EastEnders, and it features the finest dialogue you'll hear in any UK soap. Get stuck in it on the house, on the house. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God.